who is the General Secretary of the GMB Union, General Municipal and Boilermakers Union. Have I got that right? No, it's, no, it's just uh, it's just an acronym now. We've ditched oh, all so the, the, the GMB, that, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> it got out of hand. <laughs> well, j- just tell us. I mean, as I said, we will take questions to you in, a little bit later, 0345 973 But in terms of who your members are, which sectors do they come from? We've got about half a million members and they come from every sector of the economy. We've got care workers, ambulance workers, we talk about those, you know, they're going to be going to strike. Uh, health workers, we've got um, members across the private sector, retail, distribution, manufacturing, defence manufacturing, energy, you name it, our members are there. I often make the point that we have members who are midwives who bring you into the, the world and we've got undertakers at the other end who take you out and people are people who work in crematoriums. Is so. that an advantage, being a sort of jack-of-all-trades trade union rather than a specialist? Because, I mean, the Communication Workers Union, it does what it says on the tin, uh, RMT similarly, but you, you've gone in a different direction. I think it will... Our union actually was born in London. It blew up in London with uh, semi-skilled workers, really, gas workers in London. And through a process of growth and amalgamation and mergers with smaller unions, we've just ended up with this really diverse organisation. About half our members in public services, uh, which would include things like private care, and half of it's in the private sector. And it brings its challenges, but I think the enormous strength of our union is that we do understand the world of work that we organise in. It does give you a feeling for what's happening across the wider economy and what's happening in the world of work. One of the interesting things that I, I've really understood, maybe which I didn't before, when we've been talking to trade union leaders on the programme over the past few years, and we've had uh, Dave Ward comes on quite a lot, we, Christina McInerney has been on a couple of times, Sharon Graham, etc., etc. And they're very keen to point out that it's not just pay bargaining that trade unions actually do. There's a lot more to it than that, and presumably the GMB is the same. Yeah, I mean, we would be interested, you know, we, we have a big interest in things like health and safety. Every GMB shop steward, every representative we have in a workplace is also an accredited safety representative. So we have a big role to play in making the world of the work safer. And all the stats tell you, if you're in a unionised workplace, you will be better paid on average and you will be in a workplace that's safer. But we've interest in, you know, in challenging bad practice, discrimination, and we do positive stuff over pay, grading, skills, and particularly safety. How, how difficult it is, is it to persuade employers that they should recognise unions within their workplace? Um, some employers, it can be very difficult, and it's very hostile. Uh, I always make the point to an employer, when you're... When your workforce is joining a union, you can decide on the type of uh, relationship we're going to have. Uh, It's either going to be, for want of a better expression, a shotgun marriage where you're going to, this is going to happen at the point of a gun and we're going to use the statutory recognition procedures or we try and build a voluntary recognition agreement. Uh, Uber, you know, we started off a very difficult conversation with Uber. We took them to court over workers' rights. We had big challenges about their behaviour, but we ended up building a pretty strong relationship and getting a voluntary recognition agreement. Deliveroo, they want to work with us because they think it's also good for their business that their workers have an effective voice and challenge. Uh, And then on the other hand, Apple Stores, we just got recognition at the Apple Stores in Glasgow. Yeah, I was reading about that. Yeah, fantastic result. You know, young workforce, really diverse workforce, you know, techie type workforce uh, coming to the union and we had to go through the statutory recognition procedures with Apple. Now, I've written to Apple afterwards and said, look, we've got members in other stores, why don't we just sit down and try and get a voluntary agreement and build a stronger relationship? Employers who work with us, I think a lot of them would say they get a better change. You know, we're not in the business of telling companies they can't change. I always say to our people, we are, we are in, to some extent in the change management business. We just negotiate change and we try to do that for a position of strength. And if workers have got a voice in the change process, I think you often get better change and you get better buy-in from people. Do, do you think that there are many employers who still look at unions in the way that they would have done in the 1980s, sort of almost the roadblock to reform, the sort of almost Luddites protecting jobs that maybe they, they don't think should be protected? Uh, 
I I think some of those stereotypes about the 1980s, I think they're 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 unfair. I mean, I grew up in Scotland in, in the 1980s. The the biggest loss of I'm manu- wondering where that accent came from. <laughs> <laughs> I, I keep worrying that I've lost it. <laughs> no, you really haven't. We're going to be talking about accents after nine o'clock. So. <laughs> I'm, I'm listening. Um, no, you know, people were defending their communities and livelihoods. And remember, when a lot of that change and dislocation was going on, we lost you know, more manufacturing industry, heavy industry in Scotland than anywhere else in Western Europe. People's identities were shaped by their work. They were fighting for their communities and for their jobs. And, of course, people weren't stupid because there was no alternative employment coming in a lot of these communities. Mm. And that's why we've got communities the length and breadth of the UK that have been left scarred for the 1980s because... The new industries that we've been promised consistently, the green jobs thing, we're always told we're getting hundreds of thousands of green jobs. Well, there are hundreds of thousands of green jobs, but they've been created in places like China. In terms of equal pay, um, in 2022, you'd think that every single employer would understand that women and men need to be paid the same. But there, are, do you still find that there there are still some employers that are resistant to that? There's a huge challenge with uh, equal pay in a public sector, but also in private sector employers. So 50 years after the Equal Pay Act, women are still being discriminated against the length and breadth of this country. Uh, in Glasgow, we're in the midst of a long a, a protracted battle over equal pay, it will end up costing the council a billion pounds to settle equal pay claims in Glasgow. Those women were cheated out of money for years. In Birmingham, we've got a th- over a thousand equal pay claims. In fact, many, many, many thousands of equal pay. Thousand people have joined the sector. union. Public sector. And How is that even possible? Uh, because what the employers do is they try and turn a blind eye to bad practice. So we're talking about the local council here, are we? Local councils, and we will have big problems with equal pay in the health service, and we'll see that coming in years ahead. But you go to any council, and if there's jobs that are predominantly done by women, those women will be on inferior contracts in employment, and they won't be getting the true value of their labour. Uh, and this is a massive problem. But in the private sector, we're also taking challenges against companies like Asda. You, you've got women predominantly in stores, and distribution workers. None of none of those groups of workers are hugely uh, well paid, but the women are absolutely shortchanged. As they've been battling us for, I don't know, many years now, trying to resist equal pay, but I'm very confident that we're going to win that. You talked about Glasgow. Are we talking about Birmingham Council as well? Birmingham Council, Glasgow, but, Dundee. We've got equal I mean, pay. Glasgow people. Council, over the decades, I mean, it's Labour Council for many, many decades, and yeah. now SNP. Birmingham switches between Tory yeah. and Labour, but... I mean, given that the Labour Party has been in control of these councils for a, a long time, dominated local government in those cities for a long time, how on earth can Labour councillors let that happen? Uh, well, I think the trade unions, we've often not been proactive enough around equal pay as well, and you've got to be very honest about that. I I said when I was elected just over a year ago, we're going to set up a women's campaign unit that really focuses on issues around discrimination with women, empowers the women themselves to identify their discrimination, then do something about it. It's not about general secretaries. Our union's about bottom up, not top down. Um, but councils have all the rhetoric around the qualities and diversity and inclusion, and the truth is they're presiding over massive exploitation and cheating women out of money every day. And, of course, the other thing about privatisation in councils, a huge part of the privatisation agenda in public services is to try and get away from equal pay liabilities. So when you privatise a service, you get rid of the equal pay liability. Uh, and that has had a disproportionate... How can you do that? Because equal pay is equal pay by law. Because as soon as it's transferred to a private company, uh, you know there is a way you can take legacy claims. It's complicated. But by and large, if you transfer a service out, then there is no equal pay claim against the council. Now, we want that law reformed. Uh, you should be able to do cross-employer uh, uh, comparators. If you're working for a care company uh, for a council you should be able to challenge that council over uh, mm. uh, over whether you've been paid appropriately or not. I, I was interviewing Frances O'Grady, the General Secretary of the TUC, earlier for my All Talk podcast, and she was telling me that the majority of trade union members now are women, which if you think back to all of those mass meeting scenes that we all remember from the 70s, I mean, that would have been unthinkable in the 70s. But why has that happened? Is it because more women are j- just in the workplace now? Uh, it is a, a number of facets to this. More women in the workplace, organising strategies on the behalf of trade unions. You know, we put a lot of time and energy into organising places like care, 
uh, school support staff, uh, people who are invariably discriminated against in the work, and we're doing a lot of challenge of that. Uh, so it's about changes in what the labour market and also about the decline in a lot of traditional industries as well. And our membership's about 50% women. And do, do you think that will, over the next 10 years, is that only going to increase, do you think, the percentage? Uh, yes, I would suspect so, because it will reflect where we are in the economy. Uh, our membership in places like care will continue to grow. Our membership in places like retail, even though the retail sector is changing, I anticipate will, change, will continue to grow. So you are going to see more women in the trade unions. And as I say, one of the reasons we've set up this groundbreaking women's campaign unit uh, is because we want to ensure that women feel welcome in the union, that they're engaged in their union, they are leading their union, as I say, able to identify their discrimination, and the union uh, is doing the right thing around equality, around discrimination, and so our women members have the ability to challenge it. And if the worst comes to the worst, as it did in Glasgow, we end up with 8,000 women on strike. Uh, and talking of strikes, I mean, there seem to be a lot more strikes now than there have been in, in recent years. Are the GMB involved in any of those? Uh, I, I make this point and regularly. We have a thousand fires lit across the country. Uh, we have disputes, many of them which don't end up in strikes. They get re they get resolved mm. through the campaigns that we run, through the negotiation process, but through 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 the campaigns that we run as well. But we have had a lot of strikes across the country. And what is very important, because I think the media often talks about general secretaries and, you know, it's, this is about ordinary working people coming together to defend their living standards. This really is grassroots trade unionism. You know, tens of thousands of workers across companies who've, you know, seen their pay being squeezed, going back, we've not had the pay rise in this country for 12 years. People are just saying they've had enough. Joining a union, getting organised in a union, demanding a pay rise, and if they're not getting it, being prepared to withdraw their labour. I think that's an interesting point, because it seems to me that if you look at the RMT strike, for example, if that had happened 10, 20 years ago, I suspect there would have been very little public support for it. But certainly when we've talked about it on this programme, and I've sort of detected elsewhere as well, that there seems to be more sympathy among the general public now for that sort of action than there would have been in previous times. Is that your feeling too? I think... Lots of ordinary people are getting squeezed. Their incomes are being squeezed. We see what's happening with mortgage rates. You know, people are under real pressure. And I think folk are saying fair play to those people who are prepared to stand up and get organised and do something about it. But the pandemic has changed so much. And by the way, I don't think I think the Tories one of the problems is they didn't realise this as a government that people during that pandemic realised that we've got a hidden army of low-paid workers who we depend on, retail workers, distribution mm. workers, delivery workers, care workers. And so I think there's a huge... I think there's a real feeling of solidarity in the country. There was a feeling that people want to come together and there's a huge sympathy for those workers, these key workers who deliver those essential services. And the stories about ambulance workers having no PPE. I spoke to our members. I come off the phone, I've been tears speaking to our members. They've got no PPE at the start of that pandemic. Care workers, pennies above the minimum wage, living in care homes that were turned into morgues because they didn't manage the, 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 the patients coming out of hospitals into care homes. With plastic bags on pennies above the minimum wage. Whose side is the public going to be on? They're not going to be on the side of politicians. They're going to be on the side of our members when they stand up and say we've had enough. The refuse disputes that we've had, the private contractors all over the South England in particular, but elsewhere, the public outpouring and support has been phenomenal. We were on strike in Edinburgh during the festival. I think everybody was taken aback by the fact that... The, the, very the very decent support. of you, by the way, to start that strike the week after I left doing my, fringe, <laughs> my fringe shows. I really appreciated that, Gary, which Send is, me which is why, next year. Which is why we've got you on tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, joking aside, though, I mean, you must have winced at the scenes there because I mean, it d did not show Edinburgh off in a very. I mean, Edinburgh is a beautiful city, and people from all over the world come to the festival. And I mean, it was a horrible sight, let alone the smell. Um, I'm actually from Edinburgh originally, and no, I wasn't. I wasn't uh, embarrassed. Uh, I think it brought home to, you know, the festival has become, in my view, increasingly elitist and unaffordable for a lot of ordinary people. I'm very critical about the setup of the festival now. 
And I think it brought home to people that the working class people in Edinburgh, low paid workers who provide essential services, I think it brought it home in sharp relief about the jobs our people do and how important it is. I, I'm, in Glasgow during the COP conference, I mean, the place was a mess because the refuge workers were on strike, highlighting the fact that there'd been huge cuts to the services and about the, the work that these low paid workers do. I'm not embarrassed with that because people withdraw their labour, it's not easy. People standing up, I celebrate the fact that ordinary working people are saying they've had enough and they're going to take a stand. Right, much more from Gary Smith in just a moment. And we'll be taking your calls as well. If you have a question for Gary on any aspect of the trade union movement, what the GMB are doing, what you're getting from your union membership, maybe, and the future of trade unionism in the country, we'd love to hear from you. 0345 6060 973. It's 17 minutes past eight. This is LBC. Ian Dale on LBC. 21 minutes past eight on LBC. We have Gary Smith with us, General Secretary of the GMB Union. Um, Gary, let's talk about the economic news from today, the interest rate rise, 70, 75 points, highest for three decades. Uh, interest rates now 3%, which historically is still quite low. But of course, that means a knock-on to mortgage rates. Um, no doubt be rises in those. And then the Bank of England now predict a two-year long recession. Now, their forecasts are often a bit off, but I mean, they, they could have underestimated it, I suppose. Now, that's going to affect everybody, whatever their income level, but it's going to affect particularly people who are not 
particularly well off, but have a mortgage to pay. Um, how's that? Gonna, how's it all going to affect your members? I, I think there's a number of things. If I, if I could come back to you, and the, the other thing that does concern us is the weakness in the economy. The weakness of the pound means that British companies are easy pickings for companies from abroad, and that impacts. We lose jobs. We lose R and D, research and development. Uh, we lose skills, and so that's really worrying. Uh, I think a lot of British companies are going to get preyed upon. We also have a lot of companies who are heavily indebted. You know, I look at ASDA, the, you know, the huge amount of debt leveraged on that business. Now, servicing that debt is going to be more expensive, and you worry about the impact that's going to have on businesses and then jobs. And then in terms of uh, what's happening with, with interest rates, yes, mortgages are going up, but rents are also predicted to go up, and that is going to have a huge impact, particularly on the lowest paid. We've got you know inflation, as we see it, in our energy bills, we see it in our, our food baskets, our shopping every week. And this comes at a time when ordinary people in this country, wages have been stagnating or dropping for the past 12 years. So people are in real pain, and it is going to get much worse, and we're facing a couple of years of real misery. And going back to our organisation, that I think that's why people are joining unions, getting organised, because they are saying we can't afford this, or we're you know people are so angry that they're prepared to stand up and do something about it. But it, it clearly, when the economy is in this state, and I don't think nobody's going to deny that a lot of mistakes have been made, not just by government but also by the Bank of England. You've got all of the international influences now on the economy as well. That it, it must make your job more difficult to negotiate higher pay rises because it, employers, particularly the public sector employers, are going to say, well, Gary, you know there's no money. We can't give you a 10% rise, which is what inflation is, because we haven't got the money. Yeah, well, also, let me. what concerns me about the Bank of England, I mean, this is not 1970s prices and incomes t- type inflation. It, you know, wages are not driving in, uh, inflation. Um we know that we're in a really difficult time. There are huge mistakes. We've been like lab rats in the economic experiment undertaken by Truss and Quartang and by, by the Tory government, which has backfired so badly. But there are wider, deeper structural problems in the economy. We look at our manufacturing base, the wealth creating base bit of the economy. It's so weak and we've no strategy to deal with that. We've lost two million manufacturing jobs in the past 30 years. And so that means structurally the economy is very weak as well. I think what we would like to see at the moment is we would like to be working with a government that was sympathetic to trade unions to a plan for how we are going to deliver our public services in the future, how we can minimise the pain on people. We can make sure that any pain that does exist is spread fairly. The people at the top have done very, very well over the past period. It's, it's ordinary working people who've suffered most. Uh, and, of course, we want to work with employers about the long term. You know, how do we get investment in businesses, raise productivity? We understand the importance of, the importance of growth. But, of course, the truth is we've got a government that's hostile, the government has made so many mistakes, and we, we are in for a really sticky time. But people have a choice in this country. They're either going to get organised, demand change, demand something different, uh, or they're going to face a miserable couple of years. How confident can you be, though, if, the, if there is a general election in two years' time and Labour wins it, how confident would you be that things would be different? Because one of the things that Rachel Reeves and Keir Starmer have made a big deal out of is their policy of sound money. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to see a general election a lot sooner than that. What We had four chancellors in the past period, we're on a third prime minister. Where is the mandate for all these policies? You know, and I made the point... Our members, those low-paid workers who got us through the pandemic, they should be emerging into a different world where they're properly respected, properly rewarded and valued for the work that they do. Instead, after everything they've endured, the ambulance workers, the care workers, the retail workers, they're emerging into this calamity. And they've, you know, So I want to see an election now. Let's give people the choice about what the future means. I think Rachel Reeves and I think Starmer have said some really radical, groundbreaking stuff. And I think, very importantly, they're committed to working with us as trade unions to build a different economy, to sort out the absolute crisis in our energy sector. The stuff he said about a great British energy company, that's really, really interesting. And there is a commitment for Rachel Reeves to work together with business and unions in order to find our way as best we can through this economic 
crisis. What, what's the relationship between the GMB and Labour? I, it's OK. You know, I, I, it's fine. We've both got our respective jobs to play. I'm, I'm not a politician. I never tell Keir Starmer or Rachel Reeves how to do their job. I wouldn't expect them to do that of mine. Of course, we're going to place demands on them. We've got an enduring historic relationship. We understood when this union was born that we needed a political uh, voice. We're not always going to agree. And most importantly, the point I emphasise to our members, there's no political superheroes. There's no easy political fixes. Our priority has to be in the workplace, building organisation, running campaigns and fighting to improve pay conditions and things like safety. Do you think the Labour Party could be a little bit more open in its support for trade unionism? Because it seems to me that sometimes trade unions are treated by the Labour Party as sort of the the, the embarrassing cousin who doesn't always get invited to the party. <laughs> I think they, I think they, they, you know, look, the, the disputes that we have in trade unions across the economy and the public sector, this, this is, you know, this economic calamity, this crisis is of the Tories making. The energy crisis was made in 10 and 11 Downing Street. So, you know, I'm very well, clear... It's made in Ukraine, to be fair. Uh, no, I think the crisis is much deeper. They closed down gas storage. Uh, we, we had no gas storage. Uh, and we are increasingly indepe- dependent on gas imports from regimes like mm. Qatar, from America, from Russia. Uh, that as an island nation, they've reopened it this week, haven't they? The, yeah, after closing it, it cost yeah. them, it cost us more money to reopen it. You think about the power stations. We're going to have every nuclear power station in this country, bar one, closed by 2030. Our ability to generate electricity is going to decline. What's that going to do to prices? And therefore, we are again more dependent on countries like France or Norway to import our energy needs. France and Norway have a problem. They're not exporting energy to us. We have got a big issue. So there has been short-term thinking, complacency and arrogance, and, and this, this whole just dogma around neoliberalism and free markets and energy that it's all going to be all right in the night. Well, the chickens are coming home to roost and it'll cost us a fortune to sort this out. But getting back to the substantive point, I would much rather be facing into and working with Labour government. They did shoot themselves in the foot. They managed to turn the disputes in the summer the transport crisis, they managed to turn it into a Labour story rather than a Tory story. Um, but, but that was kind of what I meant on the, the whole b- banning Labour sh- sh- shadow secretaries of state or shadow ministers and going on picket lines, for example. You're right, it made the story about them when it needn't have been that way. Yeah, our airports are in a state of collapse, our railway systems in a state of collapse, our, our you know, the roads were absolutely chaos, particularly in the southeast of England, and then we end up talking about the Labour Party. I mean, they've got to think about how they manage that. Actually, but Labour... But 30 points out in the polls. Well, Labour's agenda is, uh, if, if people actually looked at what was said at the Labour Party conference over trade union rights, over collective rights, over addressing some of the historical wrongs and, and workplaces, big campaigns that we've been involved in, uh, and if you look, as I say, what they've said about a British energy company, what they've said about us working together, a National Economic Council, it's pretty radical and groundbreaking uh, stuff. Right, well, lots we've covered lots in the first half of this hour. If you'd like to ask Gary a question or make a comment on any aspect of what the subjects that we've, we've been talking about, 0345 6060 973. Ollie has asked a question on Alexa saying, why is union membership so expensive? We'll put that one to Gary in just a minute. 848. 848- 850 on the text if you'd like to ask a question and can't call as well. It's half past eight on LBC. Let's get the latest headlines from Serena Farrow. The Bank of England is warning of a challenging two-year recession as it puts up interest rates to 3%. Their committees agreed to increase them by 0.75 percentage points. That's the biggest rise though in 30 years. A review into the Manchester Arena attack has found at least one victim may have survived if it weren't for the delayed and chaotic emergency response. It found police, fire and ambulance services repeated mistakes made during the 7-7 bombings in 2005. And the UN's nuclear agency says its inspectors in Ukraine found no evidence of radioactive dirty bomb activity. It says inspections were recorded in three locations in Ukraine and were given unfettered access to the sites. LBC weather, blustery showers for Wales and the far south of England, scattered showers also developing in Northern Ireland with a low of one degree. This is LBC.
Ian Dale. Text 84850. This is LBC. 8.35 on LBC. Gary Smith is here, General Secretary of the GMB. He's going to be taking your calls. Let's go to Alex in Hereford. Hello, Alex. Hi, Ian. Hi, Gary. Thanks for taking my call. Hi. Hi, Alex. Um, so, yeah, so basically um, I've worked in both ends of the spectrum. Um, I've worked in a company that was very receptive to trade unions and, and actually supported uh, the trade union movement within the workplace. But then I've also worked at the other end of the spectrum um, where I've had a, I worked for a company that basically were completely anti-trade union, um, any discussion about trade union uh, membership or, or, the, or the company trying to, you know, the staff trying to unite to join a trade union to, to try and improve conditions. There would be emails being sent out saying, you know, you're not to do this in work time um, and, you know, that that um, you, you can come to us, you know, don't you don't need a trade union sort of thing. Um, what my question to you would be is how can trade unions help um, sort of companies that are hostile? How can, how can you help um, staff, I should say, sorry, who work for companies that are hostile to trade unions uh, be able to get a trade union into that workplace without them seeing um, sort of that hostility and, and to try and, you know, help support them, I suppose, I guess is my question. Um, the Look, for us, for us as a trade union, we put great emphasis on bottom-up trade unionism. I can't pull levers as a general secretary that, that gets a workplace organised. Uh, it is about us, imp- you know, we I do this all the time. You know, we spe- I've been in Amazon recently. I've been talking to Amazon workers about their experience, some awful stuff, and we're up against a really hostile company. Um, the problem Amazon have got, we've, we've been here for a lot longer than Amazon, and at some point we will prevail in terms of getting that business organised. But if working people want to be in a union, they, and they want the union to be recognised, the majority of them, if they join the union, there is a legal process that we can trigger to get union recognition. And we win regularly recognition battles and our job is to talk to those workers about what their priorities are probably campaign around their priorities be it safety at places like amazon be it wages in other companies um uh, and then build up campaigns that people buy into uh and you know we, we build up union membership the deal that we did yesterday in apple the apple store in glasgow i don't think apple were particularly hostile but they certainly weren't welcoming you know we just patiently working with the workforce themselves, empowering them to build their union and to get recognition. But if an employer says, sorry, I'm, I'm just not going to deal with you, what, what can you do about but that? It, there is laws around that now. You know, we can legally enforce recognition. There's processes involved in ACAS. And, and, and all is this all only on companies over a certain size? Yeah, the, the, and to be honest, those you know these are the companies that where we will get most of our uh, involvement. There will be medium size and bigger size, uh, mm. b- bigger companies. So when, you, when you're looking at a company <coughs> like Apple or Amazon, for example, uh, I mean, if there is presumably enough workers who want to unionise, you're saying there is a legal way for them to do that? Yeah, and uh, look at the stuff we've done in Apple. Talk to us as a union if you want to get organised, and we'll help you with that, we'll help you. Uh, build the membership, we'll help workers themselves develop the campaigns and the, the issues that matter to them. It may be about just having a stronger voice at work, an independent voice at work. It may be about pay, it may be about safety. Um, and we, we, we will work with people. But if you want a union in your workplace, you can get a union in your workplace. And um, we would rather work positively with employers. But if we've got, if we've got to have a row about it, so be it. That's part of the business as well. Alex? No, that's brilliant. No, thank you. I mean, it's it is something that I've I've always been sort of pro trade unions, and I, I really do think that um, you know that businesses. I think they they there is too much demonisation of what trade unions can bring to the table, um, and how they can they can actually help uh, companies as well as obviously improve the work you know the workforce's condition. So. You know, I, I think you're all doing a great job, and, and thank you, thank you very much for your and time. Thank you, Alec. But and look. Where we've got shop stewards, representatives in the workplace, I always say those workplace representatives for the GMB, they're workplace leaders. And when you've got good, effective leaders, uh, it has a positive impact. And I think a lot of the businesses we work with, we'd say at times, I hope they would say we were tough, but they can do business with us and we can negotiate and work together to deliver change. Alex, thank you very much. 0345 6060973 if you'd like to put a question to Gary Smith from the GMB. Well, let's go to that Alexa question from Ollie, who says, why is union membership so expensive, is it? 
Uh, it can be, and uh, I've frozen union membership uh, since I was elected. The last two years, I've frozen the price of union membership, um, uh, and I intend to freeze it again next year. Uh, I would like it to be uh, more affordable to be a union member. Look, we're an organisation. How is it calculated? Uh, we, you, if you're part time or you're full time, uh, that's what we do. Some unions do it on based on salaries. I find all that very complicated. We will do promotional rates for some low paid uh, workers, but we have to be mindful ourselves and not discriminating against different groups of people by people paying different rates. I want union membership to be affordable for for people. I, I never lost on me that the vast majority of you know that the, our income comes from. Uh, workers, people who many of whom are low paid, and so it's important that we we are running the organisation efficiently. Uh, but we do employ people, we do employ a lot of professionals and organisers who support people, and we've got to pay for that. Um, and the other thing I would say about union membership, if we are simply selling an insurance to people, if you've got a problem, a disciplinary a grievance, we will not be successful. We have to be adding value at work. And you look at some of the pay rises, look at some of our social media feeds, look at the campaigns that we're running to raise pay and conditions, improve safety, where we're adding value uh, to people's lives, where they feel the union is important and integral with their working lives, then it's good value for money. So what would be the sort of average union sub per month? You're just under £15 um, for full-time workers and about half of that for people who so are... Blue tick on Twitter or join a union? Uh, yeah, and and... Um, you know, if we are where we are effective as a union, when you look at what we're doing on wages and paying conditions in a lot of these companies, we are doing transformative deals in terms of raising pay and conditions for our, for our members. We are really our union membership really adds value, and that's what we're about: listening to workers, building industrial campaigns, and our membership is growing. Economic times are tough, but our membership is growing because we're doing the right things listening to our members, being in workplaces, consulting our members, they vote over everything, of pay conditions, engage with members and be in workplaces, and that's why we're growing. But I am conscious we need to run the union, we need to be as affordable as possible for people. Uh, Charmaine in Lewisham has texted this question, how can Gary possibly defend healthcare staff going on strike while the NHS is on its knees? Um, well... <laughs> I was just reflecting on this tonight. We were told that we had Brexit, that we were going to have all this money for the health service and look at the state of it and we're facing even more cuts. The NHS is in crisis. We have huge staffing shortages across the health service and people have had real terms pay cuts in the health service year in, year out. And what is putting patients at risk is the cuts, the understaffing, the lack of resources. You know, one in three of our members in the ambulance service believe, these are professionals in the ambulance service, believe that delays in the service, because of cuts, because there isn't the resources, they believe that these delays, one in three out of our members tell us that they've had, they believe that people have died because of delays in the service. It's not trade union members, it's not the threat of industrial action that's putting people at risk in the health service, it's cuts. Here's a good one. Uh, do you work together with other unions such as Unison or Unite? Sometimes. Sometimes we argue. Because <laughs> there was a time when you just wouldn't, would you? No, we all, we always work on the big issues. I think we work pretty cons constructively. Um, and uh, there's a lot of talk about national strikes and coordinated action and people get very excited. Well, actually, if, if, if two or three unions are recognised in a company or in a part of the public sector, of course we're going to work together to coordinate action. The strike action in Scotland and local government was, was the unions worked together on that. Um, so, yeah, sometimes we'll work together and other times we'll disagree and fall out. It's just, it's life. Tom in Sevenoaks says, does Gary think there's been enough support for, from Keir Starmer and Labour for the unions as a whole? As I said earlier, Tom, look, I don't believe there's any political superheroes. Uh, I don't spend a lot of time worrying about politics. I spend most of my time actually in workplaces talking to our members and involved in the campaigns that our uh, members run. But, but actually, look away from some of the headlines and look at what Labour said during the conference. There's some pretty radical stuff. This is one of the most radical pro-worker trade union agendas uh, that I've seen from a government, or, or from a Labour party that's certainly got a chance of winning, and I think they certainly do. Um, so they're committed to working with us. They've got radical stuff over employment rights and trade union rights. Um, uh, but, as I say, 
I don't want to spend all my time worrying about the Labour Party. I worry about my members. Steve is in Litchfield. Hi, Steve. Hello, Ian. What would you like to ask? Yeah, hi, Ian and Gary. Yeah. Um, my issue is, um, does Gary agree that if it was easier to get rid of the poor, underperforming workers in, for instance, the public sector and teaching profession, um, cut the costs. Everybody wants higher wages. Cut the costs and, and give pay rises to those people who deserve them. Um, we, you, you, no, I don't. Uh, I, I don't think it's uh, the, the problems in our public services are not down to public service workers, and of course there are processes to manage people in any any organisation or business. It would suit maybe government ministers, Tory government ministers, to politicians to blame low-paid public servants uh, for the problems in public services. The problem in our public services is years and years of underinvestment and cuts. The problems in our schools, you look at the way that we organise the support staff, classroom assistants, look at some of the contracts of employment and the way these people are treated, casualised, um, you know, really insecure employment. The, the, the employers are constantly trying to cut their hours. Uh, they're not to blame for the problems in our public services. It's lack of investment and, uh, and years and years of cuts and a lack of resources and low pay. If you pay people properly, you treat them properly and you and, and there's, there's money in an organisation or a service, you'll get better outcomes. Steve, thank you very much for that. Now, here's the hardest question you'll have all evening from Andy. Can you ask Gary if he still has his Lambretta and Hibs scarf? Uh, I've got several hip scarves, I, 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 treasured hip scarves, and uh, yes, I've still got a Lambretta. It's currently under a blanket in the kitchen because driving a Lambretta on the west coast of Scotland is not, it's not really you the have a Lambretta in your kitchen. <laughs> I certainly do, yes. Well, that's a diary story if there ever was one. It's been lying under a blanket for it's a, a big for kitchen. A number of years. <laughs> Not big enough for a lambretta under no, a blanket. That's for sure. Yes, I do. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, we'll take more calls in a moment. Oh three four five six zero six zero nine seven three. If you'd like to ask Gary Smith from the GMB a question, it's eight forty seven. LBC.
This is LBC with Ian Dale. Call 0345 6060 973. It's 8.51 on LBC. Gary Smith, General Secretary of the GMB, is with us taking your calls. Danny is a new caller in Manchester. Hello, Danny. Hello there. Hi, what would you like to say? I'd just like to ask a question of the, the union movement generally, really. Why, why don't they target the thousands, millions of people on benefits in this country that are able to work, um, that, that don't because it's easier to stay on benefits... That would increase the union membership, uh, give them more clout in the workplace and make the world a better place. I'm not sure here. Look, we organise workers. We we're a trade union. We're a collective of people at work. Um, what I would all I would say on benefits is this: that the real story around benefits is people working poor, people who are dependent on benefits. Actually, we have a lot of people who work two and three jobs, who are dependent on benefits to survive. That's the real scandal. Um, but our focus has to be on organising people in the actual workplace and, and who, people who are in the labour force. Do you accept that's a problem, though, in that particularly after COVID, we now have a huge number of people, I think it's something like 7 million, who are economically inactive. Now, some of them will be economically inactive for absolutely justifiable reasons. But there, ha- there are people who have just decided, you know what, I don't, I don't want to go back to work. Um, and how can they be encouraged to do so? Because I think this is a problem that the government are wrestling with at the moment. Because we have, as you know, we have labour shortages in all sorts of different sectors. And yet there are people out there capable of working that have just decided not to. Well, there's a, there's a structural problem in our economy. We are hooked on insecure, low-paid employment and we need to address the decline in manufacturing and start bringing jobs home that we've been exporting to places like China for for many years. In terms of people who are economically inactive, we see it in our uh, membership figures, a lot of people just had enough post-COVID and if you've got assets and a pension, people have just packed up. Mm. Um, But if you... we, we We talk about markets. For... Top jobs, we tell people we've got to pay these excessive, exorbitant salaries to get the right people to pay the jobs. Well, the same principle applies to care workers. If you paid £15 an hour in care, you won't have a problem in terms of you have less of a problem recruiting and retaining care workers. But if you pay them pennies above the minimum wage, of course you're going to have a problem, Mm. particularly given the experience that they've been through. You look at our airports. You know, you've had people who worked 18, 90 hours in airports a week. You know, they were sleeping on crew room floors. Eh? Um, there been huge downward pressure on pay. And, of course, many of these workers have said, we're just not going back to that. COVID did change people's outlook in life. And if you're fortunate enough to have some assets, yeah, people have packed up. You want to get people back in the labour market. I'm sure there's things around training. Uh, but it is about quality employment. And we're going to have to pay key sectors of the economy more money. Now, um Do you think there is such a thing as accent discrimination in the workplace? Because we're going to be talking about this after nine o'clock because apparently almost half of employees have had their accent mocked, criticised or singled out in a social setting while a quarter said this treatment has taken place in a work situation. Is that a problem that the GMB is going to take seriously? Um, I'm just thinking about the man with an accent. (laughs) (laughs) And who spent most days working life in the southeast of England. It's never something that I've taken offence to, I have to say. I think that the, 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 of course that will be a problem and some of that will actually be linked to things like wider issues uh, about about racism. Um, so yeah, it may be a, a, an issue that, that people experience. Well, stay it's, listening after yeah. nine, Steve. It's, it, it's going to be a good one. Right, Simon says, I like the idea of unions standing up for workers, but I'm also a conservative thinker and vote accordingly. Am I still welcome to join a union? Uh, yeah, we've got uh, we've got uh, people with uh, different political opinions in the in the trade union. We've got members who vote SNP. Some members might vote Green. Uh, the v- majority of members, because we do survey them, we do uh, poll them, uh, will vote Labour. But of course, we've got Tories who who are in union. But what percentage? Because well. I mean, if you look at the number of people who voted Conservative in the 2019 election, 47% of working class voters voted Tory and 32% voted Labour. Yeah, and you, and some to some extent that will be reflected in our membership. We did some polling, I don't remember off the top, 
top of my head before we went to the Labour Party conference and actually uh, Labour support was pretty strong amongst our members. But that isn't always the case in places like Scotland where it is very much split between mm. the SNP and Labour. And, uh, you know, I always remember we've got members in places like Wales, countries like Wales, where some of them will vote nationalist. And, of course, our members in Northern Ireland don't have the option of voting for, the, for the, the Labour Party at all. It's one of the reasons I don't get too obsessed about Labour politics, actually. A, because some of our members don't vote for it, and for the Labour Party, and some of our members don't even have the opportunity. Uh, John says, could you please ask which EU workers' regulations, not individual countries, are better than ours, and if none, which are worse? Uh, which are better than mm. ours? Um all I would say about the EU regulations, it's been very important in terms of health and safety, and that includes holiday pay. Um, we did not have a legal right to holiday pay in this country until we were in the EU and the working time directive was introduced. The reason that we enjoyed holidays in many workplaces or paid holidays was down to trade union organisation. We often make the point that trade unions, the people who gave you the weekend, um, so EU regulations gave people for the first time a right to paid uh, holidays. And let's also remember we talk about these EU regulations. I started work in London just after the Clapham Rail disaster. Some of your li listeners remember that. A tired worker working excessive hours did the wrong thing and people end up killed. So we, we have safety legislation that was brought in over working hours to protect people at work and protect people like the travel but I, th I think the point John's making is that actually our own laws are in excess of EU regulations so if you look at maternity pay if you look at holiday entitlement virtually everyone we, we already have higher standards than the minimum standards dictated by EU directors. Uh, yeah, on some of that, I would maybe take that point, but none of this stuff was granted to us. We've had to fight for maternity rights. We've had to fight for equal pay. It was trade unions that campaigned over these things, over redundancy terms. And actually, a lot of our rights in this country are far less than workers would enjoy in Europe, including rights to redundancy. Remember when P&O sacked those workers? They didn't sack workers in mainland Europe because mm. they couldn't get away with that. Um, so the rights that we do have are very limited and, they've, and nothing has been handed down as we've had to fight for, for absolutely everything that, that we've, uh, we've got. Final question from Oliver, who says, do you condone the methods of, uh, of pressure groups such as Insulate Britain and Just Stop Oil to get their message across? Uh, look, I'm, I'm, these, our members work in the oil and gas industries and nuclear industries, and um, I listen to some of this debate. It's just completely unbalanced. Um, we are going to have, we're going to need gas into the 2050s and the real debate is about where we're going to get gas from. I could say so much about energy policy, we haven't got time. But their tactics are not so, ones that I would, I would agree with, no. So you don't condone them, right? No. Um, I've got a text here. Isn't the Edinburgh accent the most employable accent in Britain? I'm sure I read that somewhere. It's, it's a nice link from this hour to the next one there. <laughs> when I come in on the radio, my mother says to me, speak slowly. And, and pronounce your words properly because the English people will not understand you. So. Your mother is a very wise woman. <laughs> Gary, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for coming on. Let's do Thank it again you. very soon. That's Gary Smith, the General Secretary of the GMB Union. We are going to be talking about accents because one in four people say that they've had their accents mocked at work. Are you one of them? And if, if, it, if that has happened, how did it make you feel and what should be done about it, if anything? You're listening to LBC. I'm Ian Dale. It's nine o'clock. On your radio, on Global Player, and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. From Global's newsroom at nine o'clock, the Bank of England is warning of a challenging two-year recession as it put up interest rates to 3%. The bank's policy committee agreed to increase them by 0.75 percentage points. Head of Bloomberg Economics, Stephanie Flanders, told LBC we have a problem similar to that in the US. We have this very tight labour market, actually good news, very low unemployment rate, but we also have something that the US doesn't have. We have this really big squeeze in energy prices. So households... There's not a lot of room in the economy. We've got this very, very tight labour market, people struggling to find people to fill jobs. At the same time as we have these enormous bills coming through the door and your shopping bills going up every time you go to the shop. 
A review into the Manchester Arena attack has found at least one victim may have survived if it weren't for the chaotic emergency response. It found mistakes were made similar to those during the 7-7 bombings in 2005. LBC's reporter Simon Williams has been looking at that report. Police, fire and ambulance services started making mistakes in the first few minutes after the blast and has decided that the failings were fatal in the case of 28-year-old John Atkinson from Bury. Medical experts say he died, not because of the injuries caused by the bomb, but because of how much blood he lost while he was waiting for treatment. It was 46 minutes before he was moved from the city room floor to an area that had been set up to treat casualties. A person has been arrested after the former Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan, was shot at a protest. His supporters say he suffered minor injuries during what they described as an attempted assassination. The UN's nuclear agency says its inspectors in Ukraine found no evidence of radioactive dirty bomb activity alleged by Russia. It says inspections were recorded in three locations in the country and were given unfettered access to the sites. Finally, Downing Street says more than a 1,000 people have now been relocated from a migrant centre in Kent. Number 10 says there are currently around 2,700 asylum seekers at the overcrowded site in Manston. The LBC markets report the FTSE 100 closed up 44 points at 71.88. The pound buys $1.11 and €1.14. LBC weather wet, particularly Wales and the far south of England. Scattered showers elsewhere, particularly in Northern Ireland, with a low of 1. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Serena Farrow. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with Ian Dale.